This is very much a Christmas Eve ghost story. And we'll start in September 1939, when a gentleman called Mr Bill Lakin stood outside St Mary's Parish Church office in Clitheroe as a member of the Clitheroe Territorial Army. There were 57 young men standing with him. The photograph was taken. They made their way down to the south coast of England, across the English Channel, straight to a place called the Maginot Line, to join the BEF, the British Expeditionary Force. They spent 10 months on the Maginot Line, walking up and down it. The French told them the Germans would never be able to penetrate the Maginot Line. For 10 months, nothing happened. But this all changed on the 10th of May 1940, when the Germans launched what we call Blitzkrieg, Lightning War. And the French were quite right. The Germans did not bother to attack the Maginot Line. They went round the back of it. The alarm bells rang, and uh, Billy's platoon of the East Lancashire Regiment were told, Right, boys, leave all your equipment. We're going straight to Dunkirk. It wasn't so much a march from the Maginot Line to Dunkirk, but a run, a race. The Germans were hot on their tail. When Bill and his platoon arrived at Dunkirk, the whole town was on fire. Black smoke was billowing across the, the town itself, and the German Air Force were relentlessly straffing the beaches. When Bill got there, he'd worn the leather off his boots and lay exhausted in a sand dune. He slept through three air raids due to exhaustion. He was rudely awakened by his corporal and told, The officer wants to see us all at four o'clock, lads. At four o'clock, their platoon commander said, Right, boys, in Dover, the Royal Navy have organised an evacuation called Operation Dynamo. It's our turn to be evacuated at four o'clock this afternoon. We'll make our way down to the water's edge. They made their way down to the water's edge and kept their rifles and equipment above the water so that the salt water would not damage the the mechanisms and the weapons. A German aircraft came down the beach, opened fire. They dived into the water. When Bill came to the surface, the sea was red with the blood of his mates. He felt a hand grab his battle dress tunic. He was grabbed by a Royal Naval rating and pulled into a small rowing boat with other comrades and then rowed out to a Royal Naval destroyer where he received the finest meal he's ever had, a corned beef sandwich, a mug of tea and a delicious woodbine cigarette. He got to Dover, couldn't find any of his mates whatsoever. An officer then told him, we know where you've come from, you do not need a ticket. Get back to your battalion headquarters at all costs. Bill made his way from Dover to London, London to Preston, and then got the branch line from Preston to Clitheroe. The train stopped in a little siding at a place called Worley, a village outside Clitheroe. Just before the sun came down, he glanced out of the side of the uh, carriage compartment and witnessed a game of cricket being played, men wearing white flannels with a beautiful scenic view behind them. He thought, this is heaven compared to where I've just come from. The train pulled into Clitheroe. As he left the carriage, he limped quite badly due to the fact his feet were still badly swollen from the, the walk from the Maginot Line to Dunkirk. He kissed the railway platform. He could have gone straight home to see his parents, but he didn't. He went straight to St Mary's Parish Church office, the territorial centre. As he opened the door, out of the 57 young men that had left, only 19 had got back, himself included. They were told there and then to make up the numbers to platoon strength once again. Bill was 19. In those days, if you were over 18, you were conscripted. He had a young friend who was 17, and this young boy wanted to join up. To join up, he had to have both parents' consent, and both parents had to sign what's called consent forms. This young boy saw Bill. Oh, Bill, uh, please get me mum and dad to sign these consent forms. I want to fight for my country. Bill saw the young boy's parents and they said, sorry, he's 17. The war could be over next year anyway. Oh, please, mum, please, dad, I want to fight for my country. They gave in on one condition, that Bill would look after him like a brother. He swore he would do. The young lad joined up, did his military training, and then the Clitheroe platoon was sent to the beautiful Greek island of Crete with the Australian and New Zealand armed forces. The whole idea of keeping Crete in British hands was to stop the German Air Force from using the bases there to attack Royal Naval bases in North Africa. The fighting was ferocious. The Brits, the Australians, the New Zealanders put up one hell of a defence, but the Germans had the very cream of their armed forces, Fallschirmjäger, paratroopers and glider-borne infantry, the very cream of the German armed forces. The Germans took the island due to superior equipment and total air cover. In the fighting, the Clitheroe platoon lost 
11 men, one of them being the 17-year-old young boy. Bill was devastated and deeply upset by the death of this young lad and blamed himself entirely. From his POW camp in Poland, he would write letters back frequently to this young boy's parents simply saying, please, please forgive me. They wrote back for the Red Cross and said, Bill, we do not personally hold you responsible for the death of our son. But Bill did. In 1945, he was repatriated. He got back to Clitheroe, but was never the same man, never smiled, never laughed. This young boy's death haunted him every day. However, things were going to change on Christmas Eve 1968, when he went to the parish church office, the old TA Hall, to watch the Clitheroe Amateur Operatic Scientist Christmas play. He was the last person to leave the building. He stood outside and lit a cigarette. As he smoked the cigarette, he looked at the wall, the same wall where in 1939 those 57 young men had stood for that photograph. He took a deep sigh and extinguished the cigarette. He then turned towards the left of the building to walk down a ginnel, a snickleway, an alleyway. As he turned the corner, he heard three whispers. Hey, Bill. Hey, Bill. Hey, Billy. He turned round and saw the ghost of the young boy in British Army uniform. The first thing Bill noted was this young boy had not aged a day. He looked exactly as he had done on Crete in 1941. The boy rose his ghostly arm. Bill, Bill, don't worry about me, Bill. I'm fine. I've always been okay, Bill. Don't you worry about me. With that, Billy's knees gave way. He knelt on the cobblestones in that alleyway, and in his own words, he bellowed like a wounded animal. The tears streamed down his cheeks. As he looked up, the boy turned, waved, smiled, and vaporised. Bill slowly got to his feet in a state of trauma and deep, deep shock. As he walked back through Clitheroe that Christmas Eve, past the happy Christmas revellers, the last thing he felt was celebrating anything. He was deeply upset. Strangely, as he got home, he climbed into bed and had the best night's sleep he'd had in years. The following morning, Christmas Day, 1968, he was woken by the sound of the Christmas bells from St. Mary's, St. Paul's and St. James. He got out of bed feeling a lot happier. He made his way to the bathroom. As he opened the bathroom door, he saw the shaving mirror and caught his reflection in the shaving mirror. He looked again. And again, as he noticed a change in his facial expression, he was actually smiling, and he felt at long, long last he had been truly forgiven for the death of this young boy on Crete in 1941. It was the best Christmas present he had ever, ever had. <laughs>